as a grad student or once you become junior faculty or even as you become more senior and take on positions of leadership in Buddhist studies, you'll probably sometimes and maybe even often encounter colleagues who are disrespectful, condescending or aggressive. This can take on a lot of different forms, but whatever it looks like, it's a terrible experience. In the next few minutes, I'm going to give you just a few examples of how this can manifest in the academic environment, where power imbalances, the valorization of competition, and a failure to enforce policies on harassment on top of a historically misogynist, white, heteronormative, and ableist environment all create an atmosphere where toxic behaviors can and often do go unchecked. If we want to stop this, we need to start by naming it and by unlocking the closed doors behind which the whole infrastructure of harassment takes place. What I'm going to describe here are actually a few kinds of things that I've known uh, myself firsthand, and so given the nature of my own circumstances, my experiences are going to be limited. I'm a cisgendered, heterosexual, white, native, English-speaking, non-disabled, tenured academic at a research one university. I wasn't a first-generation college student or even a first-generation gener professor. So this is just to say I'm in about the most privileged position possible in academia by most typically imagined measures. As a woman in academia, much of what I've experienced does clearly fit within the uh, misogynistic structures described so well by feminist philosophers like Kate Mann, Sarah Ahmed, and many others. But before I say a few things about their work, let me introduce some experiences that I bet you'll, will be familiar to some of you. For today, I'd like to stick with what I'll, I guess we'll usually call workplace bullying, leaving aside those more easily identifiable forms of sexual harassment that many of us in the academy have also experienced, unwanted physical contact or forced sexualized interactions with professors or colleagues. I can't quite bring myself to talk about that stuff yet, so let's just stick with some of the other examples of what makes the workplace and the workday so difficult. Many of you might have experienced those colleagues, for example, who are disruptive in meetings. For example, by interrupting you repeatedly or refusing to stick to the agenda that you might yourself have set. Sometimes their manner might be outright combative. If you're in a position of leadership, this can become even worse. You might experience repeated objections to your decisions in ways that are aimed at undermining your credibility or leadership. And this kind of thing can result in many, thousand, many hours of additional work, maybe many thousands of hours, as you try to figure out how to manage an aggressor's demands or mitigate the effects of their accusations. Some more examples. You might be subject to excessive criticism or even harsh put-downs in person or in emails. You could be subject to hostile glares in the hallways or social exclusion when people could turn their backs on you during meetings or in social gatherings. You could also get the silent treatment, which might show up in the form of withholding responses or information that could be necessary for you to do your job, or refusing to fulfill work commitments under your supervision. You could even find out that someone's been making disparaging or defamatory remarks about your work, your character, your personal life, to other faculty members, to students, or even to visiting speakers. I know that some of you have experiences like this a lot, maybe even all the time. Others of you might never have experienced things like this and might feel like it sounds totally crazy. In my own life, actually in my own job, and I'm not talking about middle school, but my own job, unfortunately I've experienced all of this and more. So how can you deal with all of this if or when you think it might be going on for you? Firstly, I think it can be very helpful just to start to name or identify what's happening. There's a lot of material online that you can read about workplace bullying, for example, that can be really helpful. And there are also some very sophisticated analyses of these phenomenon. First of all, you can even start with some very basic reading on places like Wikipedia. Starting even there, you can get an overview of how workplace harassment includes not only physical sexual abuse, but also emotional abuse, which is to say hostile verbal and nonverbal behaviors aiming to manipulate other people's actions. With just a little more research, you can learn that bullying in particular is defined as repeated, persistent, continuous behavior as opposed to a single negative act. I was surprised to find that there's actually a Wikipedia page on academic bullying. Another approach would be to do some research specifically on racist, misogynist, heteronormative, or ableist microaggressions, which we could really spend a whole other hour talking about here, and which are a constant stress for many people in many environments. This can include preferential treatment of certain types of people, unwillingness to recognize the effects of one's own power, or the pathologizing of cultural values or communication styles. 
Doing a bit of research can help you identify how bullying or harassment can manifest, and hearing specific examples of this type of behavior can be helpful in just defining or naming what you're experiencing. So I'll read off a long list of examples, and maybe you'll know some of these in your own life, although needless to say, I hope you don't. So there's false accusations of mistakes and errors, hostile glares and other intimidating nonverbal behaviors, exclusion and the silent treatment, withholding re resources or information necessary to do the job, behind the back sabotage and defamation or spreading rumors, trivial fault finding, accusation of lack of effort, over monitoring of work, unreasonably heavy work demands designed to ensure failure, replacing proper work with demeaning jobs, personal attacks of a, per a person's private life and or personal attributes, preventing access to opportunities like training workshops, attendance or deadlines, setting meaningless tasks, not giving credit where credit is due, removal from positions of authority or gaslighting, overwork such as setting impossible demands, or deadlines and making unnecessary disruptions, frequently acting impatient with you or treating you like you're incompetent, sabotaging you or making you look foolish, such as by forgetting to tell you about a meeting, ignoring you, not saying hello when you greet someone, not returning phone calls or emails. I'd like to emphasize that being subject to harassment or bullying at work is not something you can or should just calm down about. And it's not something you can just meditate yourself out of or take a workshop in an afternoon and get over. Starting to hate your job or your program in school would be a pretty natural response. People who are subject to harassment or bullying can also experience all, kind of, all kinds of psychosomatic symptoms and physical illnesses, like stress, anxiety, sleepness, sleeplessness, nightmares, fatigue, frequent colds, back pain, chest pain, high blood pressure, headache, migraines, palpitations, and so on. Over time, these experiences can actually cause a post-traumatic stress injury or lead to a permanent disability. On a day-to-day -day level, people subject to harassment or bullying at work can find it hard to concentrate, and they can be more forgetful, hypervigilant, hypersensitive, withdrawn, or lacking in confidence. So some of the examples of bullying on the lists I just read are easier to recognize than others, of course. But sometimes there are things like microaggressions or gaslighting that can actually be pretty subtle. And one of the problems is that we can feel unsure about whether our experiences constitute harassment or not. Some of us are more inclined than others to worry that we're just being too sensitive or too emotional. And of course, many people will tell us exactly that when we try to report something like that, like this. Often you need to talk to someone else to get an outside perspective. But there are a few questions you can ask yourself, firstly. For example, was this the first incident or is it part of a series of events? Is someone doing things or saying things in, or in order to make me uncomfortable? Would another person find the behavior in question unwelcome or offensive also? Am I being singled out and treated differently than my colleagues? Is it likely that the same comment or action would have been made toward a member of a non-marginalized group? Is there a particular stereotype associated with the comment or action in question? Am I being regularly criticized or thwarted in my efforts, even though my performance has always been good? What kind of impact or consequences do these incidents have on me, physically, emotionally, or professionally? Partly because bullying behaviors are often invisible to others and difficult to prove. From what I've read, academics who experience bullying are usually reluctant to report these problems. Because problem problematic events are often taking place behind closed doors, and because when you report them or if you report them, this reporting also happens behind closed doors, it's not unusual that bullying or harassment in academic environments can persist for a long time, with many people having trouble with a particular offender, without even knowing that this has been a long-standing problem. I haven't done as much research as I'd like to on why this is or on what the enabling structures are that make it so difficult to deal with. But certainly, power imbalances in academic environments, the competitive rather than cooperative or collaborative nature of academic promotion structures, the perceived necessity of overwork and the stress that results from that, the failure to enforce whatever policies on harassment there might be, 
the fact that performance evaluations don't take into account a faculty member's so-called collegiality or lack thereof. All of this on top of what's traditionally a misogynist, white, heteronormative, and ableist environment, all of these structural factors create an environment where bullying and harassment can flourish. And there's a lot of great research out there that really analyzes how and why these structures were formed in the first place, how they're maintained, and how they affect every one of us in different ways. As academics, we can use our research skills to learn more about this, if this isn't already a part of your research. And for many of us in Buddhist studies, for sure, we don't usually have training in this body of research. To name just two people who've come out with some important work that's really been trending recently, though, I really love the work of Kate Mann, who's a philosopher at Cornell, and who recently published a book called Entitled, How Male Privilege Hurts Women. I also love the work of Sarah Ahmed, who's done research uh, recently on complaints in the university environment and what happens to people who do file grievance, grievances or complaints about harassment and how the system helps or doesn't help them. So if you search online for Sarah Ahmed and complaint, you'll find a number of YouTube uh, lectures and podcast interviews uh, with her describing that research. So I think I said I was going to try to say something less depressing, and I'll try to close that way. I'm not quite sure how to do that, though, with this topic, but I thought I'd try to reframe it to describe how academic life in Buddhist studies should be and really can be and even is if you find the right allies and supporters and colleagues. So for grad students in Buddhist studies, for example, what you should have and what you deserve is a supervisor and committee members who support your work by showing interest in your background, your future plans, your research process, and your research interests. They should ask you questions about these things and engage your responses with a lot of interest and respect. Your supervisory and or committee meetings should be lively and supportive, and I've been in lots of committee meetings that are like that. It really should be and can be fun. You should, in general, leave these meetings feeling energized, inspired, and cared about, not depleted, anxious, or diminished. Grad school is hard enough already, and if these meetings don't make you feel worse, if the meetings do make you feel worse, then you don't have the right advisor or the right committee. Overall, you want to figure out how to situate yourself among people who treat you with respect, and in communities that embrace a culture of dignity and compassion. This is possible, and it does exist. Look around and find where it is that colleagues or professors are giving you personal responsibility and actively seeking out your views and the views of others. Find a leader or a professor who is committed to, te to team or group development and who instills confidence in others, someone who encourages open feedback and debate. Are your grad classes, your supervisory meetings, your faculty committees, are they like that? If not, can you slightly shift your community to one that's more like that? Find academic colleagues with personal integrity. Do they do what they say they will and show respect to everyone? Do they apologize when they've made a mistake? For academic leaders, which includes all professors, I think, since we're leaders in the classroom, if not elsewhere, it's not only a matter of personal integrity, but there's also a public element. They should support and help develop a culture of respect and dignity. Be available to listen to the views of others, looking for opportunities for improvement and professional development for themselves and for others, and openly challenging and unacceptable behaviors as much as they can. So if you're not in this kind of community, and I know that many of you aren't, I hope that you can make what kinds of small changes are possible to move yourself in that direction, and that you can find allies and supporters in your local environment as well to help you know how to make those changes. In addition, you know, you should um, keep up your community of uh, friends and supporters outside of school. Make sure you have uh, friends who are not academics. Make sure you have hobbies and interests, sports, music, dance, whatever it is um, that's not your work and that's not related to school. I'm not sure what's happening over there. Um, and these things, these things will really help you to um, keep a perspective and to keep, your, um, keep yourself as healthy as you can during the stressful years of grad school and the stressful years of life after that as well. So I hope that all of you will join me in trying to create a community in Buddhist studies and in academia generally where um, we can foster compassion and dignity for all of our 
members. Thank you.